So I want you to think about something for a second. I want you to think about what's a goal that you have set for 2024? A goal that you have set. Now, I know you're thinking, well, I, I have resolutions. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. How many of you had a resolution and you've already, it's done? I mean, yeah, yeah, already it's over, right? Uh, that's why I like goals instead of resolutions, because I can resolve to do it uh, until something better comes along, right? I mean, that's kind of how that resolution works. Uh, but a goal is something that you set out there that you, uh, you want to attain and you want to reach, and it's something that maybe it's a personal goal, maybe it's a business goal, maybe it's a financial goal, it could be a spiritual goal. You could have a goal for every one of those categories, but I just want you to think a second Write it down. What is one of the goals that you have set for 2024? I'll give you a second just to think about that. Because you, if you haven't thought about it, uh, you need to. Um, because if we believe that God is still on His throne, and if we believe that God is still working among humanity, then there's still something yet for us to accomplish. And there's something for you to accomplish. God has wired you God has skilled you, God has provided for you in such a way that He has something He wants you to get to in 2024. Maybe it's something that you didn't get to in 23 and you want to re-up and you want to do that, you say, you know, I need to do that again. I need to, uh, I didn't quite get there and this is, a, it's still a little bit of a stretch. See, that's the thing about the goal. You can set a goal that you could say, well, I've already attained that. You could be seven days into the year and, whoo, yeah, I already got the goal. Okay, that's not much of a goal. I mean, it's, it's great if, you, if, if it was a huge one, but it was carried over for 23 and now you've got it done. But what are you going to do with the rest of the year? You know, there, there's more to do. There, there's more that we can accomplish. There's more that needs to be accomplished. I mean, none of us have, have reached it yet. None of us are there yet. Because we are talking about Christ and church things, we understand that even if we are at what the pinnacle of this world would say is the best, we haven't gotten there yet. We know that our best is yet to come. That's the hope that has been given to us by the presence of the Spirit. Our best will be there. And between now and there, we, we're climbing and we're going and we're attaining and we're doing all that God wants us to do. What is it that God wants you to do? Have you got a goal written down? Have you thought about that? Some of you, I think, are still kind of thinking about that. But I would challenge you to, if you don't have one written down yet, that this week you really pray about that and you think through that. And, and God, what do you have for me to do this year? What is it you want me to accomplish this year? And it could be in any variety of categories, but it's important, I think, that we begin to set some of those things down and we think through some of those things. Our church has goals this year. Uh, we have three big goals that we have as a church this year. The first goal centers around evangelism, centers around evangelism. And we want to see 12 baptisms happen this year. We want to see 12. We got 11 last year. We want to see 12 this year. We want to see 12 this year. Our goal was 12 last year. We came up one shy, and a lot of that just had to be a scheduling conflict. But we want to see 12 people baptized. You say, well, that's just a number. Blah, blah. No, look, every number has a story, right? Because every baptism that we may tick off and say, well, that's one or that's two or that's three or whatever, that's a story of an individual who came to know Jesus as Savior and is following that call of faith into the baptismal waters. That's a story worth telling. It's a story worth celebrating, and I think it's a number worth attaining. And so, 12. Hey, you know, we'll all bless the Lord if we get 24, but our goal is 12, right? We haven't seen 12 in a decade, so it's time. But it's evangelism, we, and we're going to have to work at that, and we're going to talk about uh, that in just a second. It's going to take some work. It's going to take effort. These things don't just happen. 
People don't just come to Christ. Yes, there are stories that you'll find, you can find them anywhere. This person just randomly showed up in a hotel, pulled out the Gideon Bible, read it and go, I want to give my life to Christ. Yes, those things happen, but they're not the norm. The norm is when you and I get up and go out from this place and talk about Jesus every day. It's when we recognize that this is my Father's world, not my world. And in my father's world, there are rules, and that rule is to go and share, to go and tell, to go and make disciples. And making a disciple begins with evangelism. And evangelism begins with a conversation. And that conversation begins with a mind and a heart being aligned with God, led by the Holy Spirit, so that my mouth begins to open up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. No longer is it, well, I had good luck. No, it's I had God's work in my life. No longer this year should it be, well, you know, well, I just had, I just did a really good job there. No, God enabled me by the power of the Spirit to accomplish dot, dot, dot. You didn't do a great job at your job. God did a job through you because you're adhering to the biblical command to do everything you do with excellence. So you live so you can talk, so you can have a conversation and have an opportunity to have somebody come to faith in Christ. But that takes work. It doesn't just happen. But that's the the first goal we have, is that we want to see 12 people baptized this year. And praise God, I think we got number one already scheduled for January. So praise God for that. Praise God. Come on, praise God for that. Number one is already happening. The second goal we have is a discipleship goal. It's a discipleship goal. And this is similar to last year. We didn't quite get there last year, and I think it's still a worthy goal for us to attain. Uh, We want to see 50% of our worship attendants involved in some intentional discipleship, not Sunday school. Uh, We want you in Sunday school, but this goal is about being an intentional discipleship, often in addition to Sunday school. So that we're not counting Sunday school attendance for our discipleship. Sunday school is an outreach mechanism, an outreach opportunity to bring people into a conversation uh, about Scripture and about the Lord. Discipleship is when you make an intentional decision that I want to go deeper with the Lord. I want to be stronger and better. I want, I want to walk with the Lord in a better way this year than I did last year. That's discipleship. I want, I want my life to be shaped and formed not only by the gospel, but by the scripture. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit and not by my own personal spirit. I want to be be known for somebody who loves Jesus, follows Jesus, and I have a life and integrity with that. That's discipleship. I want to do that. And we want to see 50% of those that attend on a Sunday morning involved in that and, and be a part of that. And there's several ways that you can do that. You, you, can, you can get involved in a group of people, uh, four or five people that can gather together and say, I want to be a part of that. I want, I want to be in a group of people. Or I, I want to be, I, need, I want a one-on-one opportunity. I want, so, I want somebody who will walk with me through that. And I need, I need a one-on-one or I want, to be, I want to be a person that leads a one-on-one. And really, let me tell you, the one-on-one, the journey, the one-on-one approach this year, it's not that one person just teaches the other person. It's that two people lock arms together spiritually and say, I'm, we're going to walk together, we're going to learn together, we're going to get strong together, we're going to do this together for the glory of God and for God's Spirit to be living out through us. That's the one-on-one. It's not that, oh, well, I don't know enough to be, a, no, it's not about that. It's about you and another person say, we want to get together and do that. Or maybe four or five of you want to do that. And we encourage a gender-based grouping simply because it is easier and it is less traumatic if we will just have guys that meet together and girls that meet together. Why? Because there's stuff that needs to be talked about that doesn't need to be cross-gender. Because if we're honest with each other, usually it's the other gender we're mad at. the other gender we're struggling with, so we don't need them in there with us when we're struggling, right? But we just think it's safer too. If you have two or three people meeting together, it's just safer to do that. So we're providing opportunities for you to walk with the Lord in a greater and deeper way. Or maybe some of you may just, you want to start reading the Bible and you want to get a Bible reading group together. 
and you just want to read the Bible, we have, we have uh, the daily readings, we have a sheet of those in the back. If you say, well, I don't know, I don't have a Bible reading plan. Well, we have one for you in the back if you want to do that. Or you can get a one-year Bible from your, your local bookstore or online bookstore that you get that. Or you can download an app that has that. We have, or you can look in your bulletin, and in there is a reading plan that if you, gives you daily reading plans that you can have there in your bulletin. We want to see people engaging with Scripture because that is where it's found. That's where we need to be. We need to be in Scripture. We need to be reading Scripture. We need to be meeting and talking about that. We need to be developing. And that's what discipleship is. And we want to see 50% involved in that. A third goal that we have, our third and final goal that we have, centers around engagement. We would like to see 50% of our worship attendants engaged in some kind of community engagement. And we provide several opportunities throughout the year. Maybe it's because you are a part of our adopted teacher ministry over at Best Race, where every month, which is next Sunday, by the way, every month you bring a gift to, for a teacher that you've adopted. We have 42 teachers that we've adopted over at Best Race, and we provide them a gift every month they're in school. And what a blessing that ha has been for them. What an encouragement it has been for them. The, not just the gift you give, but the notes or the cards or whatever you all are putting in the bags. It becomes such an encouragement. They yearn for that. They long for it. They look for it. Because it, it's, it, it is an encouragement for them. Or maybe you or a group of you or a class of you or a department of you say, you know what, I want to, I want to take care of, of feeding our policemen. The third Monday of each month, we take a meal over to our police department and we feed the police uh, because we, we just felt a leadership in that way. We wanted to engage in that way. Uh, and I appreciate their opportunity and openness for us to do that, but we wanted to make sure we took care of that. And so every month we need a different group or a, di a different uh, set of people that would take that. Thank you, Adult 3, you're taking January. Thank you for that. Uh, but what about the rest of the months? There's a sign-up sheet as you exit the back door later on. There's a sign-up sheet for you to pick a month, your group, your whatever. Maybe it's your class, maybe it's a department, maybe it's just a group of you that want to provide. It's 20 to 25 people that you'll provide a, a meal for. And if you say, well, I can't cook a meal, you know what? You've got restaurants all over Crowley that you could go uh, buy that and supply that for. And here's the, here's the thing about doing it that way. It's great to give a homemade meal, and if you can do that, that's awesome. But if that's not your skill set, if your skill set is plastic, then, you know, hey, that's a skill set. That's a skill set. You know, you can whip that out and you place it, yeah. Uh, for some of you, that's your cooking skill set. That's awesome. But here's what you can do, because when you go in and you're buying this big meal, inevitably, they're going to look at you weird, or they're going to ask you, what is this for? Now you've got an opportunity to talk, don't you? You know what? We down at First Baptist Church want to provide for those that serve our community. And so every month we just provide a meal to our police department, and that's what I'm here to do tonight is to pick this up and bring it to them. That just plants seeds. And that's an opportunity for you to continue to engage in those conversations. Or we're working, or we, we or a part of the 4th of July celebration in our community. Or we have an Easter egg hunt, or a fall fest, or a breakfast with Santa here on our campus. We have a variety of things on and off campus that engage our community. And we want to make sure that we're engaged with that. And we want to see 50%. You say, Aaron, why do we have these goals? Because it's really easy to sit and soak it up and never serve. It's really easy to do that. It's really easy to sit. It's really easy to do. It's really easy to do that. And so we need to be we need to be serving one another and serving our community so that we have opportunities to talk about Jesus. What's your goal? That's our goals. What's going on with you? You see, over in Hebrews chapter 12, we are given some encouraging words. After chapter 11 gives you all of those that walked by faith and the wonderful, magnificent things they do, the writer of Hebrews then comes into what we call chapter 12 and begins to, to move it to a personal moment that this is what they did, now this is what you need to do. And just as that writer talks about being inspired 
and how they were inspired by the great cloud of witnesses right there in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. The writer of Hebrews says, just after, we, after all that, what we call the hall of faith in chapter 11, says, look, we have all of these that have gone before us, all of these that have laid down their lives, all of these that have lived the way that they were supposed to live, so that we can come to this moment and we also have the responsibility to do that. In other words, the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, we're standing on the shoulders of those that have gone behind us and those that have gone before us. We stand on their shoulders, but we don't need to just sit there and say, wow, this is a great view from here. We need to also be bringing up the next generation that will stand on our shoulders and stand on their shoulders and stand on their shoulders. May we not be the weak link in that process that causes the entire thing to tumble. May we be also the same as those in chapter 11 and those in chapter 12 and on and on through the centuries that got us here. May we be as those in 1896 who in this region said, you know what, I think we need a church in the Crowley area, would would then become First Baptist Church. And it wasn't even located here. It It was over on the other side of the tracks. And then in 1978, it moved to here, and now we have this facility. And then we added another building and another building, and we, God has provided all of these things. And today, we stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before us. May we also be responsible and mature and say, I'm not going to just let it end with me, but I'm going to reach a hand down and reach a hand out, and I'm going to bring others along with us to stand on my shoulders, to stand on their shoulders, to stand on their shoulders so that the beacon of light of the gospel of Jesus Christ does not fade or diminish in Crowley, Texas. That's our calling. That's what we need to be after. That's what we need to be doing. That's why we have the goals that we have set out for us as a body. You have goals. We have goals. All for the glory of God. And this is what we are called to do, and this is what we'll be leading you to do as well in this year. But here it says, we have such a large cloud of witnesses. You know, Thomas Edison had a quote, and he said this. He said, it's 10% inspiration, and it's 90% perspiration. You know, if you want to do anything, that's what it is. It's 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And that's true. We have inspiration. Chapter 12 was inspired by chapter 11. We are also inspired by chapter 11 and chapter 12 and all the centuries that have gone before us. We're also inspired by those in 1896 who thought a church needed to be in this area. We're inspired by those who moved and built a new facility over here in 1978. We're also inspired by them. Let us be so inspired that we also go out and realize the hard work that it takes to continue the dream, to continue the opportunity for those who come behind us, those who come on after we're gone, that we also leave that kind of legacy that was left for us. It cannot stop with us. It cannot stop in this generation. It cannot stop in this moment. We must continue on because we do not know when Jesus will come back. And because I don't know when Jesus is coming back and you don't know when Jesus is coming back, we must keep our hand to the plow and keep pressing forward. We must keep moving on. We must keep living in the inspiration and working with the perspiration necessary to attain all that God God has for us in this facility and in this community. We must carry on and we must continue on. And that is the call that we have as we begin this year together. So what do we have to do? Here in chapter 12, it says, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. It's so easy to lay aside. He's talking about a racing metaphor here. And sometimes those that are training will put weights on themselves in order to train with the weights, but when the race comes, they take the weights off so their body was accustomed to the weight, but without the weight, they can keep going and and go further. 
My friends, we get so tangled up in the sins of our life. They ensnare us. They trap us. And when we want to run the race, we are burdened down with the weight of the sin of habits or addictions or just poor choices, and we continue to have that weight on us, and therefore we cannot run in the way that we should. We get tired. We get weary. We get dis- despondent. We-, we live in the past when we need to be looking in tomorrow. My friends, this is what we have to do. Lay aside the weight and the hindrances that so easily ensnare us. It could, it could be bad habits. It could be bad thinking. It could be addictions. It, it could be gossip. It, it could be all kinds of things. It could be looking back at what we used to have instead of looking at what we do have. It could be saying, oh, how I wish we could be that when God says, yeah, but I want you to be this. I want you to stop looking at yesterday and pining away for it. God wants us to look back and say, let's celebrate how God has worked over all these years. Let us celebrate and praise God for all the things that He did. Let us celebrate that we are here, but let us also learn from the good and learn from the bad from where we have come so that we can live for all that God wants us to do and for His glory as we keep pressing onward. We cannot just stand still. We must keep pressing onward. Onward and upward, if you will. A statement that that I've said the, the other day was, you can't see the view from the summit if you don't make the climb. You won't see the view from the summit if you don't make the climb. The inspiration that we have, the inspiration that we need is right here in the Scripture. Let us, it is Jesus. It is the witnesses we have. We're inspired by them. We're inspired by Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith. The source and the perfecter, the author and the finisher of our faith, the first and the last. He is our inspiration. We don't do this for us. We don't do this for any, anybody else. We do this because Jesus called us to. We do it because He went to the cross for us. We do it because He died. We do it because He came. We do it because He was buried. We do it for Jesus. We do it for Him. All that we think and say and do is done because of what Jesus did for us already. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And because of that, our faith continues to be written as Jesus is leading us and guiding us. Let Him be the inspiration that we need. Because why? For the joy that lay before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look, Jesus did the hard work. He he took the cross, He took the shame, He did the hard work, and then He sat down at the right hand of the Father. May we have persistent attachment to Jesus. And not just say, well, I accepted Jesus. No, I have persistent attachment to Jesus. When we talk about, well, I accepted Jesus, that's, you've already used a past tense verb. You've already put it in your mind. That's something that I did, but it has no bearing on my life today. Oh, my friends, how wrong could we be? That singular decision is so life-changing, so life-transforming, so life-moving that it is affecting us every day of our life. The fact that Jesus died and was buried and rose again and that I could place my faith in His work and not my own and receive the grace and the honor that comes with that, the forgiveness of that, because I can receive that, that changes my life today, not just then. We need a persistent attachment that is active, that's now. I am persistently attached to Jesus Christ. I am in His Word. I am following His command. I am doing what He asks me to do. I'm going where He wants me to go. No longer is it my life, but it's His life. Why? Because He bought it. He bought our life with His blood. That's what He did. And when I... By placing my faith in Jesus Christ, this is why I use the term sometimes, and make him the boss of my life. So some of y'all don't like that, and I know that. You've told me I don't like that phrase. But we all know what it means, don't we? He gets to be boss. 
Who makes decisions? The boss. Who's in charge? The boss. That's not me. Because I made him the boss of my life. Have you? Are you? Are you being persistently attached? Our inspiration to do whatever it is he wants us to do starts with our faith. It starts with seeing who Jesus is and what He's done in our heart and our life. We as a church can look back over the years and we feel a sense of nostalgia, but we need to also have a sense of inspiration to say, look at what they did so that we could be here. Look at the forethought that they had. Look at what they saw. Look at how they looked out and saw all that was this. And I've told some of you this before, and, and, and I'll share it again. And I mean, no, I mean no disrespect to Bill, but I've always asked, why does this church face that direction? And I asked him that question. I've asked some of you that question, and here's the answer. Because at the time when this church was built, we were facing what was going to be the community that would come. Have you looked outside lately? It's here. So let us, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recognize that our job isn't finished. Jesus hasn't returned. We've got work to do. We have to climb the mountain. We've got to, if we want to see the summit, if we want to see that majestic view from the top, we have to climb the mountain. And that's the perspiration part. Verse 4, in struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Struggling against sin. This idea of just this struggle against. We struggle against sin. Look, we all face it. We all deal with it. We all have it. Paul would say, look, it's not an excuse but a reality. I can't say, oh, well, sorry, Jesus, I'm a sinner. That's an excuse. No. Well, that's just who I am. No, you've been made new by Christ. You can't act like that anymore. Well, you know, that's just, that's just you know, they're just going to run off at the mouth. That's just who they are. No. If you've been made new in Christ, your mouth's been made new in Christ. Your mind's been made new in Christ. Your heart's been made new in Christ. Your keyboard needs to be made new in Christ. We've been made new. Yes, we struggle against sin, but too often what I find is we don't struggle at all. We make the excuse, well, I'm old enough, I've removed all my filters. Put them back in. We, you need the filter. Put it back in. Let the Spirit of God be the filter of your heart, your mind, your life, your eyes, your hands, your everything. Yes, we struggle against it, and that's hard work, and we sometimes get tired, and we get worn out, and we get weary, and we're like, I just don't want to do it anymore. I know all those phrases because some of us are in the middle of Job right now, <laughs> and Job is just like, I'm tired. I don't deserve this. This, this punishment doesn't fit the crime. We feel that way. We've experienced that. It may not be you right now, but it has been or it's going to be. We struggle. The Bible is clear that between salvation and the time you, you get to go to heaven, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. We are fighting this fight that is not a physical fight. It's a spiritual fight, but it is a struggle. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, don't take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves and punishes every son He receives. So you, we will struggle against and we are going to be struggling within ourselves as well. But we need to be struggling forward. Endure suffering. That's moving forward. Endure the suffering as discipline. 
that God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The discipline of God proves the adoption you have in Christ. If you can sin and feel no remorse, you don't have Christ. Because if you have Christ, you have the Spirit. And if the Spirit's in you, the Spirit is going to bring a sense of conviction upon you. And you are going to realize, oh, I messed up. I feel bad about that. I feel horrible about that sin. And it may be one that habitually comes and goes with you. It may be something that you deal with on and off again over the years. But if you feel nothing, if you feel nothing, then you're not being disciplined. And if you're not being disciplined, it's because God's not your Father. So when we are disciplined, it's because we have a Father. And what Father who loves His children doesn't discipline His children? It proves the adoption you have. People say, well, I I sin and I feel bad about it. I'm like, at least you feel bad about that. I know lots of people who don't feel anything at all. Which is the other issue that runs through Hebrews. How can you not feel that? How can you deal with that? You need to get an understanding. You need to realize that you are proving your adoption by that. Furthermore, verse 9, we had human fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father's spirits and live? Why did we receive discipline? Why do we ever receive discipline? And, it's, and every parent, I think, on the face of the planet used the same verse. I don't know if it got passed down in parent school or what. It's for your own, yeah. You've said it or you've heard it. It's for your own good. And all of us receiving the discipline will be fat chance. But it is. It's for your own good. It is moving you to maturity. It is moving you toward maturity. You learn, if I do this, this is going to happen. I don't want this, so I'm not going to do that. We mature. People that aren't mature find themselves in in just the, the, the circle because they've never learned. They've never grown. They've never developed. They've never matured. They are immature either humans or immature followers of Christ because they keep falling back in the same thing, the same thing. We, and you're not learning. Perspiration is this sense that we have got to work at this. I don't have to work for my salvation. That's free in Jesus. But I need to work because of my salvation. I have work to do, and it's hard work. It's not easy work. And so I need to understand that the discipline not only proves the adoption, but it is preparing me for maturity. But look, verse 11, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time, right? But painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Been trained by it, that's passive. My grammar people will love that. It's passive. Been trained by it. What does that mean? It means that I have allowed myself to be put underneath the training mechanism that God has for me and my life. And so therefore, I I understand my adoption. I am growing in my maturity. And I am also going to have a sense of holiness produced in my life. This peaceful fruit of right, it doesn't come just because I wake up one day and go, you know what, I'm going to have a piece of that peaceful fruit of righteousness today. It doesn't happen that way. It happens when you put yourself under the mechanism of God that trains you. And you then begin to produce holiness. Why? Because I do this, I get disciplined, I don't like it, So I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do something different. And that different is I'm moving toward holiness. I'm moving out of immaturity into maturity. I'm moving out of acting like a kid and start acting like an adult that we're supposed to be. 
So we stop feeding on the milk and we start getting to the meat. There comes a point in every infant's life as they move into toddler and on that they move from liquid to solid food and solid food to things you actually have to chew. We as believers have the same process. We have to get out of the milk into into soft and then into chewing food. We need to eat the Word of God, spiritually speaking. This is why we provide so many different ways for you to engage in Scripture. Why? Because that is what's going to move us and make us and form us and shape us because we see ourselves for what we don't want to be and we see for ourselves what Jesus does want us to be all at the same time as I get in His Word. Because I read His Word and go, wow, Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. But I sure want to be like Jesus. And you see all of that in His Word. Get in His Word. I don't care if you read a chapter a day. Read something out of His Word. It will change you. But this is hard work. Then we get to the exhortation, verse 12. Therefore, so we said all of these things. We've been inspired. We have perspired. Now we're going to be exhorted. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. There's three things we see here that we are exhorted to do. First of all, we are exhorted to change our mind, to change our mentality. This idea of strengthen your tired hands. Yeah, he can be talking about the physical hands, but what happens when we get get tired? Our brain is like, I just want to quit. I just want to stop. I'm tired. I'm weary. I don't want to do it. And our mind begins to think of a thousand other things that we would rather be doing than what we're doing right here. Right? Right? So it's a change of mind. We are being encouraged. Let the Spirit of God change your mind set. The second thing, the weakened knees idea, is is to change our mood. Let the Spirit of God change our mood. When we are weak in our knees, it's it's, it's that we've we've given up emotionally. We've given up in that way. And he said, let the Spirit of God encourage you and strengthen you. That your mood can be better. Some of us need a change of mood in our lives. Because we have a bad mood, it seems, a lot. And I'm not sure how the joy of Jesus equals a bad mood all the time. I'm not saying you have to just enjoy all the trials. Well, actually, James says we're supposed to. Take joy. Why? Because it proves your adoption. It produces holiness. It provides for maturity. That's what it's doing. God, thank you for that discipline. Thank you. Thank you that you loved me enough to not let me continue in the way that I was going. God, thank you. God, change my mind about that. Change my mood about that. Change my maturity about that. Change me. Change my heart, oh God. Change my heart. Oh, God. In the Old Testament, there's a story. The children of Israel were coming into the promised land, and they'd fought through a lot of the promised land and fought through a lot of different things. Joshua, of course, was the general, if you will. He was in charge. He was the one that took over when Moses had died and he passed. And Joshua took them over. Joshua entered into the land with them. And they had, it was, it was, a, it was a great conquering of the land. And they were, they were going through all of these things. And his best friend, and I call it best friend because we see them earlier when they were two of the 12 spies that went over and they investigated and it was Joshua and it was Caleb who came back and said, man, we got this. Not because of us, but because God already promised us this land. Let's go get it. And the other ten were like, weary hands and weak knees. Oh, they're so big. I mean, we look like ants compared to them. They're huge. There's no way. They've got these chariot things and we don't have that. And uh, oh, they're... and they lived in fear rather than living in faith. For the next 40 years, those who lived in fear died in the wilderness. 
and those who would walk by faith survive to the promised land. Listen, guys, listen. We can live by fear, and we can be stranded in the desert for the next 40 years. Or we can start walking by faith and seeing what God has for us and believing He has it for us. So Caleb comes up there in Joshua 14. That's where the verse comes from. Joshua 14. And he said, you know what? At 85, I'm as ready to go today as I was 40 years ago when, when Moses called us to this task. I'm as ready now as I was then. And man, they'd gone through some stuff. He goes, man, I'm ready. I'm as ready now as I ever have been. He goes, I see this mountain over here. Joshua, I need to go take that mountain. I need to do it because I'm supposed to do it and I want to do it for the glory of God. And you know what Joshua said? Go take the mountain. Go take that mountain. It's yours. He gave it to, the Bible says specifically that Joshua gave it to him in the inheritance that Caleb would get. I paraphrase it to Joshua saying, go take that mountain. I don't know what mountain stands before you. I don't know what mountain God has in front of you. I know God has laid upon our hearts that we need to be baptizing and discipling and engaging. That's what God's laid before us. And we've been inspired by God to do that, but we're going to have to perspire together to get it done. And we're going to have to take the mountain. We're not going to see the view of God's glory from the valley. We're going to see it from the mountaintop. But you've got to climb the mountain. We've got to climb that mountain. And so my question to you is simply this. Will you engage in the climb? Will you engage in the climb to the mountain? Will you move forward? Will you engage in this process? Will you engage in moving, engage in evangelism, engage in discipleship? Will you engage in, maybe you're, maybe you're a baby Christian, will you just start reading the Word of God and see what God has next for you? Maybe you are a, a, a middle-aged Christian and you know enough to be dangerous. Will you take the next step? I didn't say middle-aged physically. I said middle-aged spiritually. You know enough, but you don't know it all. Or maybe you're that senior saint physically and spiritually. And you know a lot of things. But you know what? We haven't attained it yet. We're not done. We still have another mountain to climb. Until the Lord Jesus comes, there's still another mountain to climb. Will you engage in the climb? Will you engage with the next generation? Will will we not simply stand atop the shoulders of all those that have gone before us and say, yippee, look at me, but we'll stand here and say, we're not done There's others to come along. I need to put somebody on my shoulders to put somebody on their shoulders. I'm going to take the mountain. I'm going to go. I'm going to climb. I'm going to move forward because I want to see God's heart. I want to see God's vision. I want to see what God wants done. Will you engage in the process? Will you encourage somebody along the way? Will you encourage them and bring them along so that we can see how this is going to happen? And finally, will you simply enlist? We have gospel conversations to have. We have community engagements to do. We have a lot of things that we need to be doing. Will you enlist in the process? These are the questions of the day. Will you encourage? Will you enlist? Will you engage? Will you and will we together Go and take the mountain. Let us pray.